Hi everyone, my name is Kat and I'm the Failing Court Support Worker at SASC. Uh, and today we're going to be doing this video on serving and filing court documents. So just a brief disclaimer before we start, this workshop or this kind of video is not a substitute for legal advice. We cannot give you legal advice, answer, answer specific questions about individual cases, or tell you specifically what evidence you should present to the court in your case. So what we're gonna be talking about is general legal information that applies to you know, most people, most cases, um, but every case is individual and specific, and to know exactly in your case, you would need to get advice from a lawyer. So hopefully this can kind of help inform you, uh, and then you can talk to a lawyer about your individual case before you take any actions. In terms of serving documents, what are we talking about when we're talking about serving documents? So all documents that you complete in your family court case have to be served on the other parties in the case, so the other people involved in the case. And that can be your ex-partner, but it can also be any other parties. So sometimes there are other organizations involved, like Family and Children's Services, if they're part of the court case or the Office of the Children's Lawyer, or there could even be multiple other parties if, um, for example, there is more than one parent, uh, maybe there is a uh, biological ex-partner or biological father that's your ex-partner, and then there's also a, a, a stepfather, maybe that are both involved in the case. And so all of these people that are named as applicants and respondents in your case have to be served with documents. And that means basically just that they need to be given a copy of these documents. So why? Why is serving documents important? It's because everyone that's involved in a case with the court has a right to, first of all, know that a court case is happening, know that a step in that case is going to happen, and have enough time to put their own side of the story before the court. And this is to make sure that the court's decisions are fair and that they're taking everybody's point of view into account. So when we're talking about service, what are we talking about exactly? So there's different kinds of service, just like there's different kinds of ways that you can give people copies of documents. And in terms of court service, we're talking about special service or regular service. These are two different ways to serve people copies of your documents. And depending on what step you are at in the court process and what documents you need to give to the other parties, that determines which of these you need to use. Special service is required for documents that are starting a case in court or documents that could lead to a person going to jail. So these are the documents that are really important for somebody to, to get a copy of to know that you know, there's something they need to attend at court or, you know, could have a serious consequence to them if they don't find out that these documents have, uh, have been brought against them in court. And so we call this special service because we need to really make sure that that person gets a copy of those documents. So usually what that looks like is someone has to give the copy of the documents directly to that person. Um, and in this case, when we're talking about special service, this has to be somebody other than you. So if you're you know, the applicant or the respondent in your family law case, you cannot go directly to that other person to serve them uh, these, these documents that have to be served with special service. So who can you use then? Uh, what can you do? You can use a family member or a friend um, or a professional as well, and we'll talk more about that. Another way for special service is to serve the person's lawyer. So to give a copy to their lawyer, as long as you get written confirmation from their lawyer that they received those documents. You can also send the documents by mail, but you have to include with it a special form. And when the person receives your documents, they have to fill out that form basically saying, yes, I received these documents, and they have to send that back to court. So this may not be the best option if the other person, you're not certain, will actually fill that out. And the final option is to leave a copy with another adult that's living with them, living in the same home, and then also to mail a copy to that address the next day. So usually what people are doing is physically getting a copy to that person, and we'll talk more about options for that. The other type of service is regular service. And this is what we do for all other court documents. So ones that aren't starting a case, you know, there's no chance of someone going to jail. All the other documents can be served by regular service. 
this is a bit easier. This is things like sending the documents to the person's lawyer. You don't need to get that written confirmation. You can send the documents to them by regular mail, by courier, by fax. Um, and currently during COVID, they've made uh, arrangements so that people can also serve their documents um, through email if it's a regular service document. Um, and they're making that part of the family law rules as of August 1st this year to say that that will be uh, a normal way that people can serve documents that require regular services. You'll just be able to email them to the other person, which makes things easier if you have an email address for them. So what documents require special service? So we talked about things that are starting a case or could involve someone going to jail. So to give you an idea of the common forms that we're talking about, uh, because quite a few are ones that are involved in your family court case, we're going to go through some of the, the most used ones that have to be used with special service. The first is the initial family court application, which is called Form 8, because this is the document that starts your family court case. And so that has to be served by special service to make sure the other person finds out that you've brought a, a case against them in family court. Similarly, an application for divorce, which is a Form 8A, could be a divorce on its own or could be asking for a divorce along with other family law issues like custody and access. Again, also is starting a case, you're starting that case for divorce, so it has to be special service. A motion to change, which is Forms 15 and 15A, and basically all of the documents that you need to do for a motion to change, have to be served with, by special service because a motion to change is basically the same as starting a family court case, except that you're starting a family court case to change a final court order that you already have. So if you go through court once, you get a final order, and later you have to go back to court to change that, you would be bringing a motion to change. So if you're you know, starting a new, basically a new case in family court to, to reopen your final order, you have to file that by special service. Another example is a notice of contempt motion. Uh, and this is where you're asking the court to find a person in contempt, meaning that they're not following a court order. And being in contempt can have consequences such as fines or jail time. So that's why that needs to be served by special service. As well, summons to witness forms. So that's, for example, if you get to the point of going to a trial and you have witnesses, those witnesses can choose to come and give their testimony voluntarily, or you can serve them with a summons to witness, meaning that basically it's an order from the court that they need to come to court to testify. And so because, again, that is something where there will be consequences if they don't follow that court order, that has to be served by special service. And finally, a notice of motion where the person to be served faces a possibility of jail time. So there's lots of different types of motions that you could be bringing in court. Regular motions, you don't need to worry about special service, but if it's the type of motion where the consequences for that other person could involve jail, there has to be special service. And this is really all the documents that might come up in your family court case that would involve special service. So who can serve documents? So we talked about this. If you have to serve something in person, who can do that if you can't? So the person serving the documents has to be at least 18 years old. They need to be an adult. And you cannot be the one to personally serve those documents. So if you have a friend or a family member or kind of a, a mutual acquaintance, if that person uh, you know, agrees, you can give them the documents, tell them where the other person lives, they can go to their address, uh, and you know, physically hand over the documents for you. Or um, if that's not an option, if you don't have someone willing to do that, or you're concerned for safety reasons about sending a friend or family member, you can hire a professional process server. Uh, and so you can go online to you know, the Canada 411 page, put in process servers and look up your area, so Waterloo Region, and it'll give you a list of companies that provide this service. And basically what it is, is you're hiring them to physically go out to where that your ex-partner or the other parties are to give them a copy of those documents. If you have a lawyer, your lawyer will arrange for your documents to be served on the other parties. Most law firms have process servers that they use, so they will automatically arrange for that for you. 
So some of these things uh, are probably more geared towards people who are self-representing and need to serve and file their documents themselves. But it's still helpful to know what this process is, even if you have a lawyer, because I think it helps to kind of make more sense sometimes of what timelines lawyers are working on and what exactly this process looks like. So let's talk a bit more about process servers. So process serving companies usually charge a flat fee to serve documents, which will include a certain number of attempts, which is usually two or three. If they aren't able to serve the person within that number of attempts, you might have to pay more for them to try again. So for example, you could call a process serving company and say, I need to serve someone with an application for divorce. And they'll say, okay, the flat fee to serve an application on divorce on someone is, you know, X amount of money. Uh, and they'll say, you know, included in that is that we will go to his house to try and serve him twice. If we have to go more than that because he doesn't answer the door, he's not home, you know, we're not able to find him to give him the documents, you'll have to pay us more for us to go back again. There's also additional fees usually for mileage. So if the person that has to be served isn't living in our area, there's usually a fee per kilometer for the process server um, that they have to go outside of Waterloo Region. So if they have to drive to Toronto, you have to pay for their mileage to drive there to serve that party. Sometimes they have flat rates for service in different uh, cities as well. So they'll say, you know, if we have to go to Toronto, it'll be this much. If we have to go to Hamilton, it'll be this much. Uh, it depends on the company. Often though, again, there'll be a flat fee if, for example, the person serving is also living within the region. It's a good idea to call around, uh, talk to different companies, find out what their fees are and what's included in the fee. So how many attempts are included? What is mileage cost? Is there a flat fee for this area? Things like that. Often then, once you've decided on a process server, they'll ask you to provide as much information as you can that will help them with serving the documents. For example, if they're serving an application of divorce on your ex-partner, they're going to know, they're going to want to know where does your ex-partner live, where do they work, what hours do they work, uh, and that information helps them in terms of if they go to your ex-partner's house, they can't find him there, maybe they can uh, either wait outside his work to, to serve him, or maybe it helps them to know what hours they're working so they can make sure that, you know, they're not going in the middle of the day when that person's usually at work. Uh, they also might want to know if there's other people living in the home. Uh, so, you know, is there somebody else that could come and answer the door? What your ex-partner looks like, uh, and often they might ask you to provide a picture as well, so that they can make sure that they're serving the right person. Especially if, you know, they show up to the door and the person goes, oh no, I'm not that person. Uh, could be because they're trying to avoid being served, you know, for whatever reason, or if they're going to that person's workplace to wait outside to serve them the documents, they need to know what that person looks like. They might also ask if you have a contact number for them or a contact email so that if they try a couple of attempts and they still can't connect with them, the process server can contact them by phone or email to say, we have documents for you. Can we arrange a time uh, when you would be available for us to serve these to you? So whatever way you choose to have your documents served, you're going to have to provide proof of service. So what this means is the court needs to have proof that that person who's involved in the case has received those documents. So we talked about, you know, if it's something, um, you know, involved in your case, these are important documents. So the court doesn't want just your word for it. They want something proving to them that that person received those documents. So the way they do that is using a form called the Form 6B, which is an affidavit of service. And really what that means is it's a sworn statement about serving the other party. That's all an affidavit is. So whoever it is that served the documents has to complete the affidavit of service. So if you mailed, faxed, or emailed the documents, if they were documents that just needed regular service, you can complete this affidavit of service yourself. If you had a friend or a family member or a process server serve the other person, then they will need to complete that form. This document asks things like, who was it that served the other person? Who was it that was served with the documents? When were they served? Where were they served? 
how were they served, you know, in person, by email, by fax, and what documents they were served with. So for example, uh, you might be saying, I myself, um, you know, gave the documents to a process server, so they would complete the, the affidavit and they would say, you know, I, John Smith, the process server for Process Serving Inc, served documents to the respondent named Jane Doe um, on July 12th at 4 p.m. at their address, you know, 123 Sunnybrook Lane in Kitchener. Um, I served them in person with an application for divorce. So that's basically the information going into this form. And then at the end, the person completing that document needs to swear or affirm in front of a notary public or a commissioner of oaths that the information they've put in the form is true. And that's the affidavit piece, is that they're swearing the information they filled in is the truth. The court clerks at the filing counter in the courthouse can do this for you. So you can, the, whoever it is that serves the documents can take the affidavit of service to the courthouse to be filed. And when they take it there, the court clerk can do the swearing and affirming of the document with them. Once it's sworn, sworn or affirmed, the affidavit of service gets filed at the courthouse. If you use a process server, they normally complete and file the affidavit of service for you. So often that's included in the fee that you pay is that that server will take it to the courthouse, they'll have it sworn and affirmed, and they'll put it in your file for you, which is nice because then that kind of whole process is over and you don't have to take any extra steps. So let's talk about count time. So there's rules about when parties need to be served with documents. So for example, there's rules about, you know, how many days before a court date do they need the documents that are about that court date. And the, the court has rules for pretty much everything in the court process. And one of these rules is about how time is counted. So it specifies if there's a certain number of days, how do we count those days? So first of all, the count time starts the day after the effective service date. So the effective service date is basically when the court will assume that person has received the documents. So if you, somebody was being served in person, that service is effective the same day because that person is receiving those documents the same day. And because it happens one day after the effective service date, the count time for the court starts the next day. If the person is being served by regular mail, the service is seen as being effective five days after the documents are mailed. And that's to account for the time that it takes for that document to get mailed there. So it's assumed that if you mail it, the person receives those documents at least by, you know, five days later. If you're serving by courier, if it's same day courier, the service is effective the day after the courier picks up the documents. If you're serving by fax, service is effective the day the document is faxed. If it's by email, similarly, service is effective the day it's emailed because with fax and email, people are getting that instantaneously. Just a little um, caveat is that if any of the above days are weekends or holidays when the court is closed, service will be considered effective on the next business day or the next day court is open. So if you, if you sent somebody documents or served them in person on a Saturday, the effective date of service would be Monday because that's the next date that the court is open. Same thing, if served after 4 p.m., service is considered effective the next business day. So 4 p.m. or later, somebody receives a document, uh, it will be considered that they receive those documents the next day. So now that we've figured that out, it's time to figure out how do we count these days and what days are included. So the rule is, if you have more than seven days to serve or file your documents, weekends and holidays are counted. If you have less than seven days to serve or file your documents, weekends and holidays are not counted. And I'll give you an example of this in a minute. So one example here is so you're bringing a motion. A notice of motion, which lets the other person know that a motion is being brought, has to be served not later than six days before the motion date. So the other person needs to get those documents six days or more before the date that the court hears the motion. If the date of the motion is scheduled for Tuesday, August 4th, 
when would the notice of motion need to be served? So because this is less than seven days, right? We're saying six days before the motion date. That's less than seven days. So Saturdays and Sundays won't be included in this count. Then again, we want to count from the day after the effective service date. And we also don't include the date of the court date. If service is done in person on Monday, July 27th, so the person receives those documents on the Monday, the service is effective the next day, which would be Tuesday, July 28th. If we then count six days, starting Tuesday, July 28th, and we don't include the Saturday or the Sunday, the sixth day is Monday, August 3rd. That means that the latest the notice of motion could be served would be Monday, July 27th, because that would be six days before the motion date with the way that the court counts the days. So this little chart below can help you because it's quite confusing. Um, so if you served the documents for the motion on Monday, the motion could be heard the next week on the Tuesday. If you served them on the Tuesday, the motion could be heard the next week on the Wednesday. Basically, this is just showing you, you know, the, the latest you could serve those documents to still have that six days period before the motion is heard. To give you another example, which is a bit simpler, a person served with a family court application has 30 days to respond to the application by serving their own answer form. So if you were served with an application on August 1st, when would you need to serve your answer by? So this period of time, that 30 days, it's more than seven days, which means we are going to be counting weekends and holidays in our count time. So you would have to serve your answer on the other party on or before August 31st, because that's 30 days, including weekends, from August 1st. In terms of timelines, we talked about how there's rules for when documents need to be served. So I've gone through and put some timelines on here that are fairly common that you might come up against. So for an answer to a family court application, as I mentioned, it needs to be served and filed within 30 days after you received the application. After your answer uh, is served, the other person gets an opportunity to file a reply, which is their response to your form. They have 10 calendar days after being served with your answer form to serve and file their reply. Conference documents. So those are things like, if you book a case conference or a settlement conference, the other person would have to be served with a conference notice that tells them what date the conference was booked for. Also, depending on the conference you have, you would have a different form that needs to com be completed uh, and sent to the other party and the judge ahead of time. So for a case conference, this would be a case conference brief. For a settlement conference, it's called a settlement conference brief. And those two documents are just short documents that kind of give the, the court and the judge and the other party an idea of what the issues are you're gonna be wanting to talk about in that court date and what your positions are on those issues. And the trial scheduling endorsement form is similar, but it's what needs to be completed before a trial management conference. So for any sort of conference documents, any of those documents I just mentioned, at least six business days before the conference is when the documents have to be served and filed if you're the party that asked for or scheduled the conference, or if the judge was the one that scheduled the conference, if you're the applicant. Documents have to be served and filed at least four business days before the conference, if you were the one served with the notice of conference from the other party, or if the judge scheduled the conference, if you're the respondent. So this sounds a bit confusing, and it is, but basically, if the judge booked your conference date, great. The applicant has to file their document six days before court, the respondent four days before court. If you ask for the conference, you file yours first, so six days before, and the person after they receive it has to serve and file theirs four business days before. In terms of documents to bring a motion, and that's that notice of motion that I mentioned and the, the other documents in a motion, which is usually an affidavit, these have to be served at least six business days before the motion. 
but they only have to be filed at least four business days before the motion. So you have to make sure the other parties get a copy at least six business days before the court date, but you only have to file them with the court at least four days beforehand. And in terms of documents to respond to a motion, so if someone brings a motion against you and you've received those documents, you have at least four days before the motion date um, to serve and file your uh, responding documents. So as you can see, count time is quite confusing. Hopefully this gives you a little bit of a guide, but it's always a good idea to ask uh, for help with count time if you're not sure. Court clerks can help you to figure out what the count time is, uh, a lawyer can help you figure out what it is, or you can look up the family law rules online and read through uh, the rules for count time and they can help you as well. But what about if you need more time or you need to change the amount of time? So in most cases, both parties or both sides of the court case can agree in writing to extend those timelines. So for example, you know, if somebody needs more time, they can go to the other side and say, I need X amount more time. And if the other side agrees, they can put that in writing and then that's fine, they can take that extra time. The court can also make an order that gives somebody more time to serve and file documents or less time to serve and file documents if they feel it's necessary. So if there's no consent, if there's no agreement, you can ask the court for an order for more time or the other side could ask for an order for less time if there was a good reason for that. Without either of the above, court staff usually won't accept documents that have been served or that have not been served within the appropriate amount of time or that are outside of the filing deadline. So if, for example, you know, your documents were due today and you went to the courthouse on Friday, um, the court staff would say, nope, sorry, it's outside of the time, we can't accept it. Um, and then instead, you would usually have to just bring those documents with you to your court date in, and hope that the judge will accept them. At the beginning of a family court case, people are often granted extensions to complete their answer, which is their response to that initial family court application because often people get that and 30 days really isn't a long period of time if they also need to find a lawyer in that time. So that's pretty standard is that if somebody needs more time at the beginning, they'll be given another 30 days. So where do you serve your ex-partner or the other parties in the court case? You can serve your ex-partner at the address that they've listed on their previous court documents. So if you're part way along in a court case, you would serve them their documents at whatever they've listed as their address on the documents previous. You can serve your ex-partner's lawyer if you know what lawyer they're using. You can try and serve them at their last known address. So if you're not sure where they're living now, but you know where they were living a year ago, you can try and serve them at that address and hope that they're still there. But sometimes none of these options work. Either your ex-partner has moved and you don't have his information, or he could be purposely avoiding being served with court documents. So what do you do if you can't find your ex-partner to serve them? So the court requires that you take reasonable steps to try and serve your ex-partner. Examples of that are things like asking the post office for their forwarding address if they've moved, having a, whoever's serving the documents, whether that be family or friend or a process server, go to that person's work to serve them or wait outside of their work to serve them, searching online to see if you can find a new phone number or address for them, searching on social media to see if you can find uh, contact information or an address for them, contacting people that may know where your ex-partner is, if that's some sort of mutual acquaintance or any friends or family member of your ex-partner that would be willing to share that information with you. So what if you try all of those things, but you still can't find them? If you still can't find your ex-partner and you haven't, or you haven't been successful in, in getting them a copy of the documents, it's a good idea to consult with a lawyer about how to get the court to make an order for either substitute service or to dispense with service. These are two things that the court can order when you really you know, are having a difficult time getting the documents to that person. So substitute service is where you're asking the court for permission to serve your documents in a different way than normal. You can ask the court to allow you to serve your ex-partner by, for example, serving their family member, if you know where a family member is, 
by mailing the documents to their workplace, by emailing them the documents, and this is really referring to documents that need special service. If the court makes an order for substitute service, they can allow you to serve those just through email, even though normally special service means you can't do that. They can also make an order that you send the documents through social media, for example, through Facebook Messenger. There's lots of different things that they can do if you can show them, number one, what steps you took to try and serve your ex-partner so that you've taken some of those steps that we talked about on the previous slide, and why you think the method that you're suggesting will be successful. So for example, you know that they have this profile on Facebook, you know they're very active on Facebook, and you know that when you send documents, if somebody opens or sees your message on Facebook, you get a message saying that, you know, that, that message has been viewed. So you can tell the court, I think, you know, they use Facebook a lot, and I'll be able to see from the message that they view the documents. That's a pretty good explanation for why you think that method would be successful. The other uh, possibility is asking to dispense with service altogether. So what that means is you're asking the court for permission to not serve your ex-partner at all. This is a lot more difficult to get. You would need to explain, again, what steps you've taken to try and serve your ex-partner, and also why no other method of service would be successful. So maybe you can say, you know, well, I've tried and I've looked here and I've looked there and I've looked there, but they don't check, you know, they don't use social media, uh, I've left a voicemail on their phone and they don't get back to me. Um, you know, they haven't responded to my email or uh, they don't have an email, blah, blah, blah. If you can put forward a good argument that, you know, you've tried and there's no possible way to serve them and that also maybe they're avoiding service, the court can make an order that you don't have to serve them those documents. But as I said, this is a lot more difficult to get. So let's talk more about the filing of documents. So when we're filing documents, where do those documents get filed? They get filed in what's called a continuing record. So when a family court case is started, whoever brings the application, whether it's you or your lawyer, is responsible for starting the continuing record. And the court clerk would instruct you on how to do this if you're doing it yourself, if you don't have a lawyer. So there's usually only one continuing record where most of the documents in your case get filed, and that would be your documents and your ex-partner's documents or the other parties. And there's two volumes. So there's two um, kind of folders within that. One is the endorsement volume. This has a general table of contents in it that lists all of the documents in the entire continuing record. So it will say, you know, the application was filed on this date by the applicant. The answer was filed on this date by the respondent. So you'll be able to see what all is in the continuing record. Uh, it also has all of the handwritten judges endorsements and typed court orders. So endorsements are just what happens when you go to a court date and the judge makes an order. Initially, they hand write out the endorsement uh, and that's where they write out what the court is ordering, which later gets typed up, usually by one of the lawyers involved, and then it gets issued as an official court order. The endorsement is still, um, official, it still, you know, is in effect immediately, but um, usually both get filed in this endorsement volume, the original handwritten copy from the judge, and then that typed court order. And then there's also the documents volume. So this is where most of the other documents in your case get filed. So things like the application, the answer, financial statements, any motions, any affidavits, things like that. The two exceptions I wanted to mention are case conference briefs and settlement conference briefs. These two do not get filed in the continuing record. They're referred to by the judge at that specific court date, but then at the end of the court date, the judge usually hands them back to the lawyers or to the parties uh, to take back. And that's because in those conferences, you're having what are basically confidential settlement discussions. And so that's not something that they want to be kept in the record for a later judge to see. So those get handed back to you. They don't stay in the continuing record. Most everything else does stay in there. So in terms of filing documents, when you have a new document that has to be served and filed, you should make sure to take three copies to the courthouse for filing. One copy is for you to keep, one is to be served on your ex-partner, 
and one is to be filed with the court. And you might need more copies if there are more uh, respondents or more parties in your case. Any documents that have to be sworn or affirmed, which are things like any affidavits, if you have to do what's called a Form 35.1, which is uh, in support of a claim for custody or access, or any financial statements, those are all documents that have to be sworn or affirmed. So those can be done with a court clerk at the filing counter. Usually, documents are filed after they've been served on the other party, which can make things a bit tricky if you're a self-represented party. You may have to go to the courthouse a couple of times. Once, to go and get any of the, the documents sworn or affirmed by the court clerk if needed. And then once to go back and file the documents in the continuing record after the documents have been served. So where can you get any documents that you need? You can get copies of blank court documents in the filing area on the second floor of the courthouse. You can also get blank Word or PDF copies of court forms online. Uh, and I've posted the link here as well, Ontario Court Forms. If you just Google that, you'll go in and it asks you what types of forms and you would pick the family law rules forms for family court forms. And there's a list of all of the documents. There's also an online resource that provides guided pathways to help you complete certain court forms, which can be really helpful. It can be found uh, at the link below. If you go to Steps to Justice, and look up family law guided pathways. Uh, it has guided pathways for bringing an application, completing an answer, bringing or responding to a motion, uh, doing a financial statement, um, doing an application for divorce, a lot of different guided pathways that are incredibly helpful. And basically it leads you through a series of questions and once you've filled in the answers, it automatically provides you with uh, the correct document with those answers filled into it. If you're not sure what forms you need, there's a couple of places you can look to figure it out. You can check out the interactive flowcharts using the steps in a family law case, which is provided by CLEO, which is Community Legal Education Ontario. It's very helpful. It shows you a flowchart. You can click on the links depending on what step in the case you're in, and it'll tell you what happens and what forms are needed. You can also try and find the answer to your question on the Steps to Justice webpage uh, under Family Law. You can type a question into their search box uh, or look at the ones that they have answered. Uh, and it often provides as well a link to the correct document that needs to be completed. And you can also consult a lawyer. So how do you go and file your documents at the courthouse? Upon entering the courthouse, you wanna take the escalator up to the second floor. You go through the doors at the top of the escalator and that will take you into the room where the filing counter is. Along the left-hand side of the room is a big wooden desk, and on the far side of it, you'll find a ticket machine, which asks you to select the type of matter you're there to file a document for. So you would select family, and it prints out a number ticket for you. You can then take a seat on the benches and wait for your number to be announced out loud or shown on the board. There's a little electronic screen that's attached to the ceiling that shows what number is currently being called and what counter you need to go to. Then once it's your turn, you would go up to the counter, speak to the court clerk, and they'll help you file your documents. To give you an idea, if you haven't filed documents before, this is what it looks like. So you can see you would come up the escalator over here, go through the entrance doors. Then here's this big desk here. On one side, we have uh, copies of the blank court documents that you can pick up. And it's only for the most common court documents. Uh, on the far side here is the ticket machine. These are the benches where you can wait. And this is where the family court filing counters are. And there's multiple court clerks lined up along there to help you. There's other filing counters along here, but they're not for family court matters generally. And then there's also some desks along at the bottom and the top of the room that have um, little kind of sections between them so that you can privately fill out any documents by hand if you need to. And on the far wall here, there's also another counter that provides things like phone books um, and other kind of documents that you might need to look into. So, and finally, there's also a door into the Family Law Information Center in here as well. So this is what it would look like and what the process would be like if you needed to come and file documents at the courthouse. If you have any questions, you can feel free to email me at courtsupport 
at saskwr.org. Otherwise, uh, I'm glad I got a chance to talk to you about serving and filing documents today, and I hope it was at least a little bit helpful to you. Take care.